Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Inside Retail Store Safety. Before we begin our presentation today, I would, I would like to take a few moments to go over some housekeeping items. We will be recording this webinar and this presentation is CLE approved and we will be asking you to enter a passcode for CLE credit a few times throughout the presentation. In today's webinar, Mr. Loderstedt will discuss retail store safety for in-use premises liability casework, typical types of cases that occur in the retail store, areas where these types of injuries often occur, management issues, and resources for standards within the industry. To give you a little background about our presenter, Robert Lodestet, he has 28 years of experience in material handling incidents involving pedestrians and equipment operators. He holds a master's degree in advanced management from Pace University of New York and has worked and trained extensively with Phil Julio, who holds 28 years of experience in the retail industry. Mr. Loderset has provided testimony in both de deposition and court and has worked on 95 pre retail premises liability cases. He has also provided CLE presentations to law firms and insurance companies. For those of our attendees who require a code word for tracking purposes, the code word for today is retail. During the presentation, we will take short breaks, and during that time, we will ask that you enter this code into the chat feature for CLE reporting purposes. The chat feature is located to the right of your screen. Please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must log on to your computer as yourself. If you have attempted to log on and received an error, or if you are listening via telephone, please email the passcode both times that is requested, and please state the time that you have entered your code in your email. Also, please remember to complete the survey that will appear on your screen at the end of the presentation. As a provider of CLE credits, we are required to have supportive information that you have attended, and in many states, the survey is required. Mr. Loderset welcomes your questions. Please use the chat feature to submit your questions throughout the presentation. We will take intermittent breaks so that Mr. Loderset can respond. Thank you all again for attending today, and Robert, the presentation is now turned over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for attending, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to thank CASA, and specifically within CASA, Carol Kowalski, who's the VP of Operations, and Nadia and Emily, who uh, function in the marketing department, uh, for helping me with today's uh, session. Um, so with that, um, we'll begin, and I'd like to assure you that you will get a minimum of at least one to two things you can take away and apply when you get back to the office. Uh, objective of today's session, and it really doesn't matter from my perspective whether you are a defense attorney or a plaintiff attorney, but you will get intelligence that you can use in your retail uh, slip and fall type cases um, to bolster your cases and or thwart uh, efforts uh, against you in a case. Um, so again, it doesn't really matter whether you're defense or plaintiff attorney. Um, it's about getting you intelligence. You get a lot of information. Uh, getting that translated into intelligence that you can use quickly and effectively is what today is all about. Uh, as a result of this uh, time that we'll spend together, um, you will be able, as I spoke of earlier, to strengthen your case both from a strategy and an approach perspective, thereby giving your customers the most favorable outcomes that you can achieve. Uh, an approach. So, so things that you want to think about is basically are folks inspecting what they expect as it relates to their mode of operation and their business in retail. And what you want to be able to do is determine whether management has established their strategies, they have tactics uh, concerning the health and safety practices, and are they ensuring to the best of their ability the well-being of the customers or employees and very importantly, are they deploying these policies and procedures in a written format? Are they providing initial training to employees? Are they providing ongoing training to managers and employees? And are they implementing mechanisms and procedures to forward look for proactive analysis of their risk management department and or employees on site data about past incidences so that they can see that they are complying with these policies and procedures as it relates to safety, as well as finding out how they might be able to 
tweak or modify a procedure or a policy to mitigate or eliminate risks and accidents uh, at the retail store level. So what you're going to be able to do is look to determine whether or not those practices are being consistently applied uh, across the industry, and we're going to talk a little bit later on about the customs and practices and applicable standards uh, within the industry and the insurance industry that um, ensures a number of these retailers. And to the degree that you can benchmark against that, um, you will be in the best position to understand the practices of the management, the operations, the risk, the overall safety, and how they establish and utilize visual and merchandising store design. So that's the approach that we're going to take. A little bit of background in the retail uh, store industry. There's a little over 36,000 supermarkets with sales of over $2 million, and you can see the top 15 retailers by sales um, in the industry. Um, so there's a lot of large players that make up the industry, and there's also a lot of small players that many of you may be involved with in, um, in cases with those retailers. 60% of general liability claims filed against grocery stores in the grocery industry are the result of slips and falls. I'm not sure that's a surprise to anyone, but it's always interesting to know it's a significant number, like 60%. And the industry um, spent $450 million in defense of slip and fall claims, which was out just doing simple math to almost 12.5 uh, average annual money spent per store for defense of claims. Now, looking at uh, the various types of uh, incidents that occur in stores, you have slips, and that's on anything from liquids to, to produce to eggs to hangers, shelf tags, price tags, uh, leaking equipment, uh, which typically will put fluids or water on the floor. You have grease, ice, snow, weather-related type stuff, debris, cardboard banding. And then on trips, a number of items that can be tripped on, presentation platforms, hand baskets, pallets, uh, bread trays, clothing racks, uh, product carts, mats. And then from a falling merchandise standpoint, you have signs, merchandise, boxes, cases, displays, etc. And then you have uh, struck buys. Uh, which involves some type of material handling equipment, either a, a manual pallet jack, an electric pallet jack. In some cases, they have uh, small forklifts that find their way onto the floor in operations like Walmart, and, uh, Lowe's, and uh, Home Depot. And then there's a piece of equipment called a Wave. that's a work assistance vehicle that allows folks to travel at about two miles an hour, three miles an hour, and elevate up to about six feet uh, to do some restocking or initial stocking. Um, in grocery stores. Now, areas within the supermarket where uh, injuries have occurred, this is a result of uh, 750 cases that Bill Giulio had published in his book uh, as a retail safety expert over a number of years that he was involved with the industry. Um, and the work that he had done in those 750 cases showed that the grocery aisle produces 32% of incidents Plus can fall, and you can see 25% produce, front door seven, dairy and meat. So that gives you kind of a sense as you are looking at your case, if you're in a defense mode, um, where is your client having those types of injury, injuries and, uh, and, and incidents and accidents, and what might you provide in terms of advice and counsel on a go-forward basis with the client. Now, within the industry, uh, the overall management and safety responsibility falls in a number of areas, um, and that goes from the very top, the ownership, down through store leadership, the risk management group or loss prevention group. And, and there's a real distinction there. Loss management is uh, loss prevention. Typically, it falls with un, with, within the risk management group, and they're really looking from a security standpoint and a uh, shrinkage and theft standpoint. But there are risk management people who are really looking at overall safety policies and how one reduces exposure and expenses by eliminating both uh, customer and employee uh, incidents at the store level. Store management plays a key role in this and obviously down to the employees, and certainly we know that clients do have an obligation to be aware of their, their surroundings from a safety standpoint. Now, typical defenses would be one of notice, uh, one would be certainly it's a customer responsibility 
uh, it wasn't anything that we created or we needed to, to worry about. The customer uh, was responsible for that incident. And then keying in on the fact that it's an isolated incident um, as opposed to stepping back and looking more at a mode of operation type of a scenario. So these are the things that I have found typically uh, come into play in terms of arguments and uh, defenses within the industry. And I think at this point we're at uh, questions. So, Emily, you... Uh, Yes. You want to pick it back up here? Is there anything you want to add, uh, add relative to the uh, CLE procedure or any questions that have come in? Um, we don't have any questions right now, but we will have a, um, a stop for questions in about two slides. Okay. Okay. I have lost my presentation, Emily. Um, can you move it forward for me, Emily, because I've lost it? Sure. Okay. The next slide should be negligence or mode of operation. And there. there we go. Oh. Okay. We have negligence or mode of operation. Uh, sorry, folks. Um, and here, um, you really can have both if you can show that there's been a sustained pattern of behavior. Um, that shows either non-acceptance, non-conformance, um, and or compliance with uh, the regulatory and retail industry customs and practices or applicable standards like ANSI and OSHA. Uh, there's insurers' suggestions and recommendations that are in the marketplace uh, and in publications, and you have the company's own documentation or lack thereof. From a defense standpoint, the best defense is to have in place and to do on a regular, regularly uh, scheduled basis with trained and retraining of employees and documenting those customs and practices of the industry along with any specific ones to your store operation. So those are the types of things that you need to be thinking about as you look from a negligence and or mode of operation perspective. Okay, Emily. You have the traction auditing. Yes, we're on that slide. Okay. And that's just a quote that I won't read, but it goes to the issue of the best defense is to make sure that you are following the customs and practices of the industry and documenting the fact that you're in compliance with those things. Okay, Em. We're on the next slide. Okay. Now, um, Again, here, whether you are trying to bolster your case as a plaintiff attorney or thwart that uh, plaintiff attorney, the kinds of things that you want to be thinking about and the kind of things that you want to be armed with and the kind of things you want to know about as you move through your case are the company's overall philosophy, kind of starting with the top and coming down, the values, and then strategies and tactics. And you can find these in a number of different places. You can find them on websites. You can follow them, find them in their written policies and practices and procedures. Um, you can find them in their corporate governance, ethical standards, and responsibilities. Um, you would be amazed if you um, are dealing with a publicly traded corporation, what you can get in pulling up their 10Ks and their corporate governance and uh, ethical standards statements. Uh, within documentation that's available on the web. In fact, there's one major chain that at the board level of ethical standards actually says there should be a safety plan uh, at each store level. The other thing that's important to understand, regardless of which side you're on, is the size of these operations. Many times they'll go to a particular store location, a client, and think of that as a mom-and-pop store, which gives a certain perspective as opposed to understanding that that individual store is really part of a rather large franchisee or a rather large corporation that may have a billion, two billion, three billion dollars in sales. The relevance, the relevance of that is it clearly demonstrates that a company of that size has a risk management team and has certain duties and responsibilities. So you need to be cognizant about ensuring that you understand where this particular client is as opposed to a one- or two-store operation versus being part of a 
uh, a rather large corporation or a large franchisee. And then, of course, you have those regulatory and retail industry customs and practices that we talk of. And those retail customs and practices are basically the safety manuals that have been in the marketplace for 10, 15, 20 years uh, within the industry that make up the de facto standard. And then there are other specific standards that are closer to what you as an attorney look at as a standard, like uh, an ANSI standard and an OSHA standard. And then, of course, you have the influencers, the Liberty Mutuals, the Zurich, the Grocer Insurance, the Grocer Insurance and the CNAs, which publish um, articles and documentation about safety in a produce department or handling slips and falls or documentation um, or how to deal with uh, employees who are injured. So these are the kind of things that you want to be able to turn to as you start to assemble and pull together your case. All right, Emily? Sure. Before we move on to the next slide, I just want to take some questions. But first, I wanted to just have the attendees type the passcode into the chat feature. And can everyone also please let me know if they can hear the presenter? Okay. Okay, I think they're, they can hear you then. Is there a standard of practice in the industry with respect to retention of surveillance videos? Um, there is not a standard per se. Um, typically, they'll be kept for 24 hours, uh, 48 hours, maybe 72, and then they're taped over. Uh, I will talk a little bit later, though, again, regardless of which side you're on, plaintiff or defense, as to why you may want to think about always going to that tape and always saving more than two minutes before the incident and 30 seconds after the incident. And um, I'll talk about that a little bit later on in terms of um, what I believe would be helpful um, in terms of making sure you've looked at and you have copies of that uh, incident. And if you don't pick it up in that video, there's still a strategy and there's something that you want to do relative to those surveillance videos a little bit later on. Okay, our next question is about items falling from overhead shelving in a hardware store. From a plaintiff's yeah. perspective, what should they expect in training? Any industry standards and where to find them? Uh, we're going to start getting into that now. Uh, we're going to start getting into that now. Uh, typically, with the falling merchandise, uh, you will find some statements of things that um, should be being done in the National Safety Council, some of their documentation. You also have references and customs and practices of the industry, the, the safety manuals, etc. Okay, I think those are all the questions we have for now. So we are on the where do you turn to bolster industry. Oh, wait, we have one more. What is the industry standard for sweets? Uh, again, we'll talk about that, but I'm also talk about it now. Uh, what you will see typically is a minimum of a sweep hourly. Uh, National Safety Council talks to frequency and events. And I find that to be more relevant. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of jump ahead here, but it, it's probably a good point to, to talk about this. Um, you should at least be conducting inspections by trained employees hourly who are looking to identify and remove hazards. In the produce department, that should be at least every 30 minutes you should be conducting that formal, and it really isn't a sweep. It's really more of an inspection because you want to make sure that you have scheduled inspections by trained employees who have been trained to identify hazards and then to remove those hazards um, to avoid incidents. Now, other factors come into play. If you have, obviously, a Black Friday if you have that week leading up to Thanksgiving, that week leading up to Christmas, if you have significant events occurring, 
the first day corn's going to be put out in produce. Uh, I don't know if any of you are from New Jersey, but uh, through the, uh, the Mid-Atlantic region, there's a chain called ShopRite, and they do an annual can-can sale when you can buy 10 cans of any of the canned foods, 10 for a dollar. Um, stores are mobbed in those time frames. So it isn't just relying on what typically you will find in the customs and practices manuals of an hour. You really want to be understanding what the frequency of your customers are in, in, on that particular day or during that particular time frame within a day and what might be special events that necessitate you having those scheduled inspections done sooner than every hour. Okay, and where would one get articles published by insurers? Uh, you get them on the uh, you can get them on the on the web. If you Google slips and falls, and uh, you Google travelers, or you Google grocers insurance, or um, Arco, or Zurich, I mean any number of them, uh, you'd be amazed what you'll find. Okay, and are you seeing less cases involving floor covering, traction, lighting, polish issues? and more involving human error in placement of goods and warnings, frequency of safety sweeps, maintenance of refrigerator units and stocking? Um, I, in my experience, it, it comes down to either the store having policies and procedures and either, A, not implementing them or not implementing them by trained employees, um, and not documenting that that work has been done. So it tends, in my opinion, to be more of a failure on the part of the management team to either have in place or put in place those appropriate methods and procedures to do everything you can from a defense standpoint to demonstrate you've done these scheduled inspections by trained employees, you've logged it in, you have active, and again, we'll talk more about this later, you have active safety committees, You've been proactive in doing um, analysis of incidents to look for patterns and trends in the store to which you can make tweaks or complete changes to a method and procedure. So it tends to be more on the, the, the really, it's the mode of operation. Um, you know, I don't get too much in the polishing stuff. Um, I don't get too much in the lighting stuff. I, but I tend to find it's really just the method of operation that either is not there through any documented processes to do anything or if you have it in place, it's not being done. Okay, and do you find that they're cracking down on fraudulent um, slip-and-fall cases? Well, I, I, now my personal opinion is that's something that I think has been done consistently. I think there are a number of folks that, um, you know, over the course of time, that they, they certainly are faking these injuries, um, and those, I think, are picked up and then they're, you know, prosecuted accordingly. Um so the answer is, yeah, there's, there's certainly effort and energy put at that. Okay, and what can we do if our client does not have written sweep sheets? Can we still argue notice? You can argue notice. You can argue notice um, how successful you will be, in my opinion, depends on what documentation um is put forth on the uh, request for documents and your depositions, and then what what is coming out in, let's say, if, if, if an expert is paying the expert's report relative to customs and practices of the industry and the fact that they've not been followed. And then it becomes a, an issue if you wind up in court as to what the jury thinks of not documenting when, in point of fact, that tends to be a custom and practice in the industry. Okay. And is there a time frame promoted by or on behalf of the retail industry or trade association of frequency of safety sweeps through aisles, and what are experts saying is reasonable? Um, I'm not aware of anything written from the uh, association, the industry associations. Um, and, again, um, the majority of the safety manuals talk about an hour uh, and a half hour, every half hour in produce. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, 
understanding the frequency of customers and particular special days, Fourth of July, Labor Day, those are days when management knows because of other metrics they keep, they know that those are traditionally going to be busy days, and there you want to err on the side of maybe moving those hourly sweeps down to every half hour on the 4th of July or Labor Day or Memorial Day or whatever the special event is. Okay, those are all the questions we have for now. We will take questions later on, so please okay. continue on the presentation. We're on the negligence yep. side. All right. Uh, we're on the building your case, right? Yes. Sorry. Build your case. Okay. Right. Okay. And, and here, if this is kind of just a checklist for you all to be thinking about. Uh, you do want to get a copy of record retention policies, uh, and a lot of times people say, well, that's not even relevant. Well, it's relevant if you're supposed to be keeping um, incident reports for seven years, ten years, twelve years, um, and in point of fact, you can't produce them because you throw them out every two years, but you've got a record retention policy that says you need to keep them for twelve years. Um, you also want to make sure that you are um, understanding, regardless of which side you're on, what are those documents that those written uh, and current policies and procedures that get into the scheduled inspections uh, by trained employees with, again, an hourly at a minimum but and, and 30 minutes of produce, but understanding about traffic conditions and events and special things that are occurring. Uh, there's a couple ways that that typically gets done. There are manual sheets where that is done, and there's also electronic systems. Um, in either case, it does offer you the opportunity to do analysis of that data uh, on a proactive basis looking forward. And then it's very important to make sure that you're uh, providing refresher training to those employees. And that's earlier on where I talked about inspecting what they expect. So you really want the management within that retailer at all levels to inspect what they expect. So if you expect hourly inspections and you expect that they're going to be identifying and looking to remove all hazards, you want to audit that as the manager or you want to audit that as the safety coordinator or you want to order that, audit that if you're a slip and fall safety specialist. Um, recording of the inspections, we kind of talked about that earlier and making sure people understand how to record that. Um, you want to make sure your safety committee, you have safety committees. A lot of the stores have safety committees, but you find they don't meet on a monthly basis. It might only be attended by management when, in fact, some policies and procedures might call for representation of union and non-union members as well as management and employees, and they're on a scheduled basis, not ad hoc. The manager steps out at 9 o'clock and grabs five employees because we're going to have a, a, a safety committee meeting. And there should be scheduled meetings, and there should be agendas, and there should be minutes, and there should be training involved here. And in a lot of, of the chains, the, uh, the stores establish metrics or key performance indicators or, or goals, numeric goals, that the safety committee uh, are looking at uh, each of these monthly meetings to see how they're doing against the goals. So if they have a goal of reducing slips and falls by 20% with customers, they can see how they're doing on a monthly basis to be able to determine what things at the store level they would be recommending should be being done to try to meet and exceed that goal. And we can go to the next one on that building your case. Okay. Go and ahead. We, yeah, but as I mentioned on the last one, you, you, you cannot have a management team that's just saying, well, we have inspections every hour and I'm not going to inspect what I expect, well, I'm not going to audit that. It needs to be audited to make sure that not just so much that people are doing it, but that people are doing it correctly. I mean, if you're ever in a store and you, you, you see someone doing these inspections, uh, they'll be texting on their phone, they're, they're looking at the floor, they're not also looking at the shelf to see if the merchandise is stacked incorrectly at the top of the gondola. Um, so there's a number of things that present hazards that need to be trained and refresher trained on, as well as the function of someone in management auditing that. And then I talked about that proactive analysis that you want to do. I think that's extremely important because what you're demonstrating here is what you see in the very first page of most of these safety manuals, and that is safety is the most important thing. Nothing is more important than safety. All accidents are preventable. 
Um, and yet, when you get through the process of looking at that operation, you find that the types of things that one would do to make sure you're functioning as safely as you can are not typically done. And it would be my uh, opinion that if you are doing these things and you wind up in court, you're telling a story and you're showing a mode of operation that is, in fact, proactive. You're driving off metrics. You're driving off methods and procedures. You're auditing these things. You're logging this stuff in. You know, it's pretty hard to say what more could you do. So those are key things you want to make sure you're doing. Um, you also um, want to be prepared uh, to give up, and if you're on the other side, the plaintiff's side, you want to try to get at least two years of incident reports. And, and that's always a battle, um, but provided with that information, regardless of which side you're on, let you do your own back at the napkin calculations to get a feel for are there trends, are there particular times of day, are there particular days of week, are there particular areas within the store. Um, those types of things could, if, if you can arrive at potential um, tweaks or, or modifications to the process, um, then certainly someone in that store should be able to be doing that, and again, doing that well in advance. Appropriate police reports. Um, you can go to local police departments, and for a very small fee, you can get copies of all dispatches that were made to that particular store, and while they don't give you tremendous detail, you can determine from those reports whether or not it occurred in the store or outside of the store, um, and many times it may say slipped in a certain aisle. Now, if you're on the defense side, I would invest in getting that, uh, that printout from the police department. Uh, good luck trying to get it out of a big city like Philly or New York City, but in some of the smaller towns, you, do, you can get that, and whether you're defense or plaintiff, that's information that you need to know relative to bolstering or thwarting, um, depending on which side you're sitting on. Now, on those surveillance uh, videos, there's a couple of things that I believe should be being done. I say here in my presentation a minimum of two hours pre and post. Um, in some cases, if you know that you are doing these inspections and you're doing them regularly but you're not documenting them, you may not have captured the incident on the surveillance video but if you've got eight hours of video on those store cameras, you probably can show a pretty predictable pattern if what your client has told you is accurate, that they are pretty much every hour having someone going down all the aisles to do inspections. By being able to demonstrate that in court through those videos of having, you know, every hour that store was open that day, you can see pretty much every hour on the hour, every hour, give or take five minutes, there's an individual who's going through that store doing the inspection. That's pretty powerful. So that's just information and intelligence relative to something you should think about. It's something you should think about because typically, as we all know, you get, you know, a minute or two, if, if you're lucky, before you get the actual incident and you get ten seconds after. Um the written safety policies that exist for the customer or the chain and then job descriptions are important because job descriptions, they, they start to tell a story. And a little bit later on, I'll take you through some things you can kind of develop um, from, a, from a factual analysis standpoint based on obtaining some of this information. Emily, if you can get to the next one, please. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. So we should be still building the case here. Um, Training records um, and training material, that's important regardless of which side you sit on because you'll, you'll get a better understanding of what the employees are being trained to do, how they're being trained, how often they're being trained, and that's very helpful, again, regardless of which side you're on so you know what's going to be happening. And then to try to get key performance indicators. Those are the metrics, the goals, the objectives that are written um, and are used by store management and used by safety committees and used by risk management to track how you're doing. I mean, if you're not measuring something, it's pretty hard to say you're getting any impact or getting anything done. But it's amazing how many times I've had stuff come back saying, 
it's unclear, it doesn't make any sense, it's going to not lead to anything, and we don't understand what you're asking for. So I just, that one kind of, I don't know. So it's important to understand those metrics and those goals. Um, on your depositions, it's really important to think about who you're going to depose, why you're deposing them, what's the sequence, and get help in developing your depo questions. If you are going to work with an expert, the expert should be willing to develop supplemental requests for production for you, or if you get them in early enough, they can help you develop your initial request for production. They should be willing to develop deposition questions, lines of questioning for your depositions, and they certainly should be able to help you in some requests for admissions as you move through the process. And some things that you want to try to do in the depositions I have found is you want to ask why at least three times. Now, it's not like, why, Bob, why, Bob, why, Bob? It would be through the course of that deposition, ask why at least three times. Typically, the third time you ask why, you're going to find out what the real answer is. And depositions, you should not be doing until after you have responses and documentation on your request for production. So those are important things. And then when you get your 30 v 6 folks, um, that's a, a little bit of a different ball game because you're not getting someone familiar with the actual incident but rather someone is familiar with those overall policies and procedures. And those can be important because uh, I've actually owned and run a number of businesses in my career, and it's interesting when the person at the top says, oh, yeah, we do this, 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 these are our philosophies, these are our philosophies, these are our procedures. And then when you get down at the operating level, it's like, oh, I didn't know that, I didn't know that, I didn't know that. So, again... Regardless of which side you're on, you want to know about it. If you're on the defense side, you want to know what the folks at the top think and is it finding its way down. Um, and uh, from a plaintiff standpoint, you certainly want to know that from, from how you're going to handle your case. And then you want to make sure that you are and have done at least one store visit um, and what I call a shopping visit. Uh, the, the problem with a scheduled store visit is the attorneys are there and if you want to find out what's really going on, get there about an hour early because it's amazing where you'll find people picking up stuff in that aisle an hour beforehand so that it's spotless. In my opinion, that doesn't serve anybody well um, because the reality is things are going to happen. Um, I'll give you an idea for your depositions. Um, one of the things you may want to think about asking uh, the individual that you're deposing is you, you might want to, on the front end, indicate to them that, in your experience, most people do not listen to understand. Most people listen to reply. And that you would hope today that you would be listening to my question, thinking about it and replying as opposed to formulating your answer as I'm still asking my question. And you might find that helpful. Uh, as we all know, how many times have you been in a discussion with someone, and as soon as you're done, their immediate response is, yeah, but, or but. When you hear yeah, but, or but, they really haven't heard a thing you've said. They've been formulating how they're going to respond to whatever it was you're talking about. So you want to might think about just, you know, asking them. Most people do not listen to understand. Most people listen to reply. Uh, did you give me an idea as to are you one that listens or are you one that just is listening to reply? Okay. Uh, next page. Okay. Um, there's been a, at least one case in New Jersey um, where... Uh, an expert was not used, and as a result of that, um, the case went up to the uh, appellate division, and, and uh, it was upheld that it was a finding for the defense, and they threw out the case. And it has to do with water in a frozen food aisle or a dairy aisle or a chicken aisle. 
Um, and there was no real way other than to say, well, look, this was obvious. I mean, it's obvious this water is on the ground. It obviously came from that freezer. Um, and it's not obvious from the standpoint of having someone who can factually talk about how that water may well have gotten there. So when you're involved in cases with liquids in the frozen aisle or the dairy or the meat, chicken, or bagged ice areas, you want to make sure that you're finding out things like the last time that that particular case was serviced. Most times it's an outside HVAC service company, but you want to find out the last time that was serviced and you want to get a copy of that service record, the last time the freezer was power washed, and that, again, could be done by employees, the last time they reset that freezer, or they may have taken out the merchandise that was in there and put a different type of merchandise in there. So when was the last time they reset? You can go to the next one. Okay. Um, in terms of the last time the freezer case in the entire store, um, due to leaks or power outages or anything like that. So you're looking to isolate initially that case, and then you're looking at the broader issue of cases um, to determine are there any patterns here. Then you want to get the name of the HVAC company that's doing the preventive maintenance and the repair work. Um, and then you want to get that service contract with duties and responsibility, and you want to get copies of the documentation for any servicing that was done uh, or any preventive maintenance that was done. And then also, you want to find out how often those drains um, that are at the bottom have been checked for clogs, because if that drain gets clogged, then you're going to have that water kind of run out onto the floor itself. Next. Okay, go ahead. Okay, now, in a lot of the things, and I'm not sure there's a lot of new things that you learn there, but it's good maybe to hear it from somebody else uh, as, you, as you build your case and you build your strategy and tactics. Um, you're also going to have to educate the court because the judge, because a lot of times one of you will wind up trying to compel the production of certain documents. So regardless of what side you're on, you've got to be able to go through an education process with the judge to help them understand why the ruling should go for you versus the other person. Okay. Next page. Okay. All right. Um, here's some things that you can get when you can factually um, develop information uh, and you can obtain information as a result of production. A Gleason is an automated system where folks have a wand, an electronic wand, and they go around and they touch these little silver buttons located throughout the store. And each time they do that, they can signify that they had a, a wet spill, a dry spill, or everything was clear. And then that data can be downloaded on a daily or weekly or monthly basis to see uh, what types of hazards were done. And then, obviously, if they see a wet spill, they're going to clean that wet spill up and then show that it was clear. Um, here was an analysis I did that had 10 months' worth of data. Um, there were 14 scheduled inspections that were supposed to occur um, each day, I had 304 days worth of data, and the data showed that only on 20% of the cases, 20% of the available days, the 304 days, only 64 days were any inspections being done, and in one particular case, there were, or a number of days, there were no scheduled inspections at all during those days. Some had inspections as low as 1.5 inspections over those 14 required. And the high, the high was not quite six inspections. So there's an example of what I talked about earlier. You have a system. You have a process. You've invested a lot of money in the Gleason system, which is a great defense if people are doing it. But if you're not doing it and that data, you're compelled to produce that data, you can see the kind of analysis that can be done that is a pretty compelling story as to, you know, wow. Um, so understand this. If you're on the defense side, you got to understand it. If you're on the plaintiff side, obviously you want to try to get it, and you want to try to do some analysis. And that's a proactive analysis. And if you or I can do it on the back of the napkin, the risk management people and folks at the store should be able to do it and take corrective action. Um, 
I had another situation where I had 21 days worth of data with a Gleason system. They did the inspections 100% of the hours. They had to do it every day, 18 hours a day. They did it for 18 hours a day, 100% of the time for those 21 days at all locations in the store. So there was something like, I don't know, 19 or 22 locations they had to go to through the store. But what was interesting was they had, we had identified 841 hazards identified and logged in over the course of 21 days. And that's got to tell you something. That's got to tell you something if you find 841 hazards logged in on a system in 21 days. So kind of stuff you got to think about. Next page. Okay, we're there. All right, and here's when you get paper. You get incident reports. 28 months of reports. They average 1.4 incidents per month. Liquids accounted for almost two-thirds of the incidents. 85% incurred, uh, were occurred um, in the uh, PM uh, after 3, and then the incident itself occurred at 3 PM. There were six porters working on the day of the incident. And if you do that analysis and you reschedule those porters so that you move one of those porters off the AM shift to the PM shift, you've added an additional 20% of eyes to be able to work these inspections, and you've done nothing to eliminate the work that had to be done by the remaining two porters in the AM, uh, with like cardboard and bailing and things like that, cards, etc. So, again, the kind of things that you can look at if you have that kind of data. And if you're on the defense side, it's stuff that you should be looking at, because if you wind up having to give it up, you ought to know what may or may not come back at you. Okay, next. Okay. Um, job descriptions are, are very telling, very telling. Um, and this is about a story. It's really what you're telling is a story. And here was a job description for a store manager. And within that job description, the individual, this is a store manager now, and I always like to say, you know, if there's a problem in one of my companies, the fish thinks from the head down, has no documented safety responsibilities, no involvement in safety committees, no metrics for safety, and the first time there was a 680-word job description, the first mention of safety was the 473rd word, and it said, keep the store safe. So what does that really mean? It means if you're looking at a mode of operation, it may not be being done in such a way that they're really trying to make sure every accident is preventable. Next page. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the next one uh, had to do with a case involving hand baskets and the collection of those hand baskets at a retail store. And there's not a lot written in the customs and practices or the standards about collection of hand baskets. So I went out to 13 chains across two states, 22 locations, and was able to determine that nobody – collected hand baskets the way that this defendant collected hand baskets. What they did was to take a little dolly and spend, just nest these hand baskets one inside the other, stacked seven and a half feet high, not held down in any way by bungee cords, and then it would just push it along. And it just so happened that a customer hit that stack and fell over and, and injured a woman. When I went to these other stores, you were able to see that they were either collected and nested in groups of five or six and hand-carried, or they were bungee corded down so that they couldn't fall, so action was taken. So getting out and actually seeing how things are done from kind of a forensic standpoint is helpful. And um, there's also a retailer that there are two editions of their safety manual out there, and the first manual interestingly enough, says each member owner must personally choose one. And then in 2004, and I've had a lot of, in my company's corporate attorneys that I worked with, this always reminds me that corporate attorneys work, it was changed from must personally choose one to it is suggested each member personally choose one. So I don't know, did the store, did the chain get so safe they could go from a must to a suggested, and then I give you one more. This had to do with bagged ice and um, a leak out of the uh, 
freezer that held the bag ice, the bag ice, it leaked underneath a mat, and an individual wound up hydroplaning on that mat with a pretty severe injury. In that particular case, I went to five states, 39 locations, 15 chains, and found that none of those other chains or locations had their bag ice machine in the main front cross aisle right across from the registers. So that's just, again, one more piece of, of how you tell a story and how you can substantiate that by getting out in the field and getting a feel for what's going on. Okay. Okay. All right. Next one is um, what does the future hold? Um, and in, in my opinion, I think you're going to see kind of more of the same. And this is what I think. And I think it's because typically... Most of the stores have a million dollars in liability coverage, and to the extent there's a cost-benefit analysis being done to change your mode of operation, it probably is too expensive and doesn't meet those internal hurdle rates. So I think you're going to wind up with a continuation of the kinds of things that are occurring. I'd like to think we could all affect some change where it gets better, but I don't know. I don't know. Okay, next page. Okay. Uh, next page has to do with visual merchandising and store design, and I think you're going to see more and more of this um, get pulled into your cases. Um, there are two organizations. There's the visual merchandising and store design, and you can subscribe to their magazine. And there was one called DBI, which is Design, Display, and Innovation. It's now changed their name to be Retail Design. And... Each of those organizations have advisory boards, and it's interesting to see how a number of the big players, both in uh, in big box stores and retail as well as supermarkets, have a fairly high rep- level high representative serving on that um, advisory board. So, if you want to go to that next page, sure. Now. Some of you are probably saying, okay, that's great, Bob, but, you know, why are they doing this? Well, they're doing it because shopping today is really about making the clients feel good and giving them an overall satisfactory experience. And when you're able to do that, the visual merchandising and store design attracts customers, and it leads to increased sales. You go to the next page. Okay. And where they're employing that in the store is how they merchandise through displays. They're using color, an example of color. Next time you go, I mean, if we were working together here live, I'd go around and ask some of you where you shop. Um, But next time you go shopping, go in the produce aisle and look at the peppers. And you'll see three or four rows of green, three or four rows of yellow, three or four rows of red. So color and presentation through that color is a great way to draw folks' attention to the peppers as opposed to paying attention maybe to where they're walking. Lighting has become key in how they establish and they reinforce this feeling good and this experience. So lighting comes into play. You have signage comes into play. Uh, you actually have some locations where they'll have signage on the floor, uh, which isn't necessarily bad unless you trip on it, but there's signage that now appears on the floor. There are themes. Uh, you go into the Coles and you go into, uh, you know, the Nordstrom's and, and stores like that, and you'll see mannequins, not even the old-time mannequins, new mannequins, that fit the human body, so to speak, that are fully outfitted from head to toe, including accessories. And that's all geared to enabling us to look at that and say, wow, I could look like that. You know, I could look like that. I could see how I could look if I buy that. The other theme that you find is, and you'll see this again in produce, you'll see in a, um, uh, you'll see in produce, typically in a standalone uh, container, you'll see uh the, the tomatoes, you'll see mozzarella cheese, you'll see basil, it's on ice, and that's all to help us remember tomatoes, basil, mozzarella cheese, go together, 
and it gives us that sense of maybe I should pick that up and bring that home. From a safety standpoint, it's sitting in that bucket of ice, and that bucket of ice melts, and if it's not properly draining, you've got a particular issue. And then you have the way the actual store is laid out. Again, a good example of that is when you go in a grocery store and you go to the produce aisle, it is typically not laid out like when you normally go shopping. Normally, you shop up aisle one, come down aisle two, back up aisle three, down aisle four, and so on. When you go into produce, you are serpentining through that. So you're moving around and you're, you're, you're getting exposed to the maximum number of faces that are there that have product. But it's all geared to having us feel good and all geared to having us buy more. Next page. Okay. Now, the kind of folks that are in there, I mean, this is a degree. This is a four-year degree program, and there's masters for this. These visual merchandisers, they have knowledge of architectural principles. That they, they understand the psychology of buying. They understand design. They understand fashion psychology, inventory, and they're extremely creative people. And they step back, and they think of the store as an entire unit. And therefore, they're putting strategies together that are looking to convert onlookers to customers. And I actually had two cases that involved, um, or I was able to bring in the visual merchandising and store design. And in one particular case, we brought in the, um, the district visual merchandising manager. And it had to do with the way a rug was constructed on the floor in a main cross aisle. And one of the questions that was asked was, when you, uh, when you do this visual merchandising with these rugs and you assemble these rugs using squares, uh, what safety considerations do you take into, in, into heart when you, when you do these rugs? And the answer was, well, we don't. We don't think about safety. So that would be a really good answer, uh, depending on where you're sitting, I guess. Okay, next page. Okay. So one of the things that I would just ask you to think about, I would submit to you that onlookers don't look out for hazards, that their senses are really engaged with the visual merchandising and store design elements. So the rhetorical question would be to think about, can that negate notice, or can notice be negated? Next page. Okay, go ahead. All right, now, uh, the last thing is if you take one thing back for use at the uh, office, um, I gave you that one that you might find interesting about most people do not listen to understand, and I would offer you... Next page, Emily. Okay. Nothing is impossible to the person who doesn't have to do it themselves, and we've all been there. We've all had bosses that have said, I know it's Friday, I know you got plans for the weekend with the family and the kids, but I need you to work the whole weekend. And most of us, unless you're a millennial, most of us will work the entire weekend. And we come in Friday morning at 7 o'clock, or Monday morning we put the report on the boss's desk, and we say, so how is the report, boss? And if we were all sitting in a big room, I'd ask you, and what does the boss say? We know what the boss says. He doesn't say anything. It's now 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, probably 11 o'clock, you walk in and say, boss, what do you think of that report? And we all know what the answer is. I didn't get a chance to look at it. I haven't looked at it. So... Think about that as you go back to the office and you work with other people, and if you can go to the next page. Okay. And if you're involved in any kind of outside support using an expert or something, please think about retaining them uh, very early on in the case and not 30 days before your GED, and make sure that that expert can help you by preparing, as I spoke earlier, about supplemental requests for productions who you should do it, uh, and, and, and then your depositions, getting depo questions for you, and who you should be deposing and why, and, and kind of arguing back and forth with you. Um, and don't wait till the night before. I was called last night at five minutes to five because he wanted to prep for a depo the next day. So while you can help them, it's easier if you got a little bit of time to help. And I think we're up to questions. Yes, so could all the attendees please type the passcode again into the chat feature? 
Okay, and our first question is, what are the applicable OSHA ANSI standards addressing the frequency of floor sweeps? Um, ANSI does not deal, this is 1910-176, it deals with the, uh, the show handling equipment. They don't get into uh, floor sweeps uh, or floor inspections. They're dealing more with the equipment and the training of operators and things of that nature. The ANSI tends to get into, uh, that's uh, ANSI 1264-2. That typically gets into issues of mats and runners and when, they're, when they should be used, how they should be used, making sure you don't create a hazard by putting that mat out there and it's serving the kind of purpose. So that doesn't really get into anything other than to have a housekeeping program. Well, it does say record keeping. It says have a housekeeping program. You should have record keeping. Um, you should have trained employees. You should have supervision. So if you go to an ANSI standard called 1264-2, um, I try to remember exactly where it is. I don't have it in front of me. Uh, but you'll find a section there that deals with um, housekeeping, inspections, etc. And it talks about having an inspection program uh, and and. Uh, and, and, and documenting those inspections. Okay, and what are the biggest mistakes that you've seen by an attorney while handling these types of cases? Um, I'm not sure they're mistakes. Um, you all have extremely difficult jobs to do. Uh, you're juggling a lot of different balls at one time. But some things, and again, using the theory of nothing's impossible to the person who doesn't have to do it themselves, I'll share with you a couple things that I always lament. Uh, I couldn't have provided something in the form of help early on. I notice a lot of times in depositions, you are on to something and you are heading down a great line of questions that are going to, or a question that's going to produce some pretty powerful answers. And it's like you stop after two questions when one more or two more might have given you the proverbial smoking gun. Um, I also find that a lot of times um, you you either call in the 11th hour um, or you call when you're pretty far down and you really want to engage somebody early on in that process, uh, even to be able to help think about strategy and 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 why we're doing what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, I guess um, those are probably the those are probably the two biggest things. Um, and I, and I, I almost find with the depots sometimes you've, you've written out all your questions and it seems sometimes hard to deviate from that line of questioning uh, when you really have something needed that's kind of thrown out there. Um, so it's really when you engage the expert, making sure you get an expert that's going to spend time with you and not nickel and dime you to death, um, and really thinking about your depositions, because in my opinion, the cases are settled or won um, in those depots. I mean, the production is important, but it's the depositions are key. So those would be the two things that I would I would offer up. Okay. And are there industry standards as to how often bathrooms on the premises should be inspected and floors cleaned? That is a great point. Um, one of the things that um, there's no there's no standards, but you will find that a significant percentage of retailers require hourly or every two hour inspections. So that goes to a custom practice. An hour or two hour inspection of the restrooms used by clients and employees. And on the back of the door, there's a written log where they actually log in the time. Now, the thing that I always find interesting is whenever I go to a store, whether I'm working or not working, 
I always go in the restroom because it's fascinating. It fascinates me when you find out they do no scheduled store inspections by trained employees to identify hazards um, and to eliminate those hazards. And yet, when you ask the question about the job of a porter, you'll find out many times one of the roles of the porter is to every hour or every two hours go in and actually have a task of six or seven things they need to do in the restroom. And I just have a that, that's I have a hard time. I don't really have a hard time, but I think you understand what I'm saying. That's just a, a real tough one. Okay, and this question is from Scott. He says, we are seeing more and more cases where the retailer does not have a scheduled sleep, but instead claims that their employees are trained to always keep watch. Thoughts versus industry standards and liability? Well, you're right. You hear our employees are trained to be looking for hazards, and many times they'll add the word continuously. Uh, I, I would counsel you to have your clients be careful of the use of the word continuously. All of our employees are continuously looking for hazards because when they're continually looking for hazards, I always ponder, well, does that mean it will take me two days to be checked out? Who am I going to get my half a pound of Swiss cheese from in Delhi if all these people are continuously looking for hazards? So it's 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 done a lot by businesses. They will tell you they do it. The problem with that is if it's not written down and required and it's not logged in, I think you're really hard pressed to convince people you are really doing it on some degree of a regular basis. So it's not good enough because what happens is People get diverted to do other tasks, the store gets busy, and folks are called up for bagging, and you can have significant periods of time that are going by when employees are really not doing anything as it relates to inspections. And if you have some time, next time you go to the store, just spend some time looking, you know, stay in a particular area and just observe how often... They're looking for hazards versus just taking the clothing from the uh, the area that you know the, the changing rooms and just hustling out to get it put back on the rack. Uh, you, you, you're hard pressed to see people consciously looking for those hazards, and then you, you you run the risk of finding and being able to show that that hazard existed there for a significant period of time, um, and therefore you can state with you know, surety that it had been there a period of time long enough that the defendant knew or should have known and should have had in place the scheduled inspections to remediate that hazard. Okay, those are all the questions we have time for today, but if anyone wanted their question answered, they could email it to us and then we can send it over to uh, Robert if that was okay with you. That's fine with me. Okay. Let's see. Uh, there's one last thing I'd like to add if there's no more questions that come in. Hearing no more questions, I'll, I'll, I'll offer you one other thing. Um, when, you're, uh, when you're talking about uh, in, your, in your depositions, and that would be to ask the client or suggest to the client there are preventable accidents and non-preventable accidents and ask the client or ask that individual being deposed could they give you an example of a preventable accident or I'm sorry a non-preventable could they give you an example of a non-preventable accident and it's interesting the kind of responses you get back because you'll get a response like well I guess maybe if a lot of snow built up on the roof and the roof collapsed that would be a non-preventable accident. And while that's not necessarily a wrong answer, the answer you're kind of looking for would be something along the lines of one of you is coming into the store and your child's in the uh, seat of the carriage, they have their sippy cup, and they drop the sippy cup, and coming up four feet behind you is somebody else who slips on that water. That's a non-preventable accident. 
and then you have preventable. And many times in manuals it says all accidents are preventable. So that allows you to at least engage them in a conversation about was that particular incident that occurred on the date of the incident, was that a preventable incident? And that always begets a pretty interesting conversation. So I would I would offer that to you as a non-confrontational lead-in. Okay, thank you very much, Bob. That's um, a very helpful tip, I'm sure, for all of our attendees. Um, we have come to the end of the presentation, and I do want to thank Bob so much for the work that he put into this presentation. Um, and the effort and his knowledge and experience that he shared with us this afternoon. Uh, for those who are applying for CLE, this is important CLE information, the webinar is eligible for CLE credit in California, Illinois, Minnesota, Missouri, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Texas. However, to ensure that you are eligible and do receive your CLE credit, it is important that you complete the survey that will, appear, that will appear at the end of the presentation. Without the survey results that you reflect um, that you complete, we are not able to provide the CLE credit. So please take a moment to complete that survey. I want to thank you very much. On behalf of the TASTA group, which in addition to being your best source for testifying and consulting experts, we do also offer research reports um, on expert witnesses, as well as e-discovery and document management solutions. And again, also these interactive webinars, which are available, and we do um, continue to offer these for our clients. And if you have any suggestions of a topic that you would like um, us to research an expert for, for a presentation, please feel free to get in touch with us. Again, thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again on our next webinar. Take care and have a good day.